Christ to come into their life, that they might be saved and give their lives to Christ. And baptism is a symbol of what they've done inwardly. And as Christ gave his life on the cross, was buried in the tomb, the third day resurrected from the dead, they're giving their outward expression of what they've done inwardly, that they have taken Christ as their personal Savior. They're no longer that old person, but they've been born again, and that they're a new person. Let us pray together. Father, I thank you for your gracious love and your mercy, and you gave your life in our place for our sin, that we might be able to have eternal life with you. I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.
wrote that song, wrote a lot of other gospel songs, and then somewhere along the line after that, he got discouraged, and he went back to the other way of life. And now that he's got old, he's <laughs> turned back the other direction. Amen. I used to think that being a Christian was something for old folks. <laughs> when you got to where you couldn't do anything else, and when you're all dilapidated and wore out, then that was the time that you went to church and started living right. You ever think that? <laughs> when I was young, I didn't have time for it. But I learned something. There was seemingly in my life, there was always something missing. And I look for it and I search for it. And what I tried to do, I tried to fill that void in my life with things. And I promise you, if you'll go to your house today and take inventory, you look through your shed out back, look in your back rooms, look at all the places that you've got covered up, I promise you, you're going to find things that you bought, that you thought that you wanted at that time, and after a little while, you disregarded it, and you put it out in the shed, and you paid a lot of money for it, but how long did it make you happy? For a little time, a little period, and then you said, well, I need something because there's a void in my life. I'm searching for something. So you went out, and you got something else. This is a prime example. You ever buy a car? And the next morning before it's time to get up, you've got to get up to walk to the window to look at it. No. <laughs> and the first day you have it, the second day you're out there wiping on it and washing on it and cleaning on it. That's the grandest thing that you ever got. Then six months goes by, and then a year goes by, and two years goes by, and that thing you wiped and worked and shined and spit and polished, you look at it and you say, that's a piece of junk. I need another one. Well, the void that you, I'm going to preach in a minute. <laughs> that void that you're missing in your life came in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and broke fellowship with God. Right. God no longer walked with man. But the problem is we spend it trying to fill it with things. But Jesus on Calvary over 2,000 years ago gave his life in our place that we might be restored to God and have fellowship with God. And more than that, that our gift would be from doing that, that we would have eternal life in heaven. Now, this thing is not a Baptist thing, not a Catholic or a Methodist or a Lutheran thing. I'm not going to ask and never have asked anybody to become a Baptist. That won't get you anywhere. I have asked and do ask and will ask to receive Christ as your personal Savior because that's what changes life and gives you eternal life. The only time that a preacher is in demand is when somebody is deathly sick and in the hospital. They want to call for the preacher. The next time when somebody dies, they want to call the preacher. But other than that, we preachers are not in much demand. In fact, I was the same way. If I seen a preacher coming, I'd run the other way. I didn't want to listen to what that cat had to say. Right? Bottle heads. Right? Okay. I'd like you to turn your Bible this morning to the book of Matthew, the seventh chapter, 21 through 23 verses. Then I'm going to preach from the entire chapter of the 7th chapter. And I'm not going to preach long, but there are some important things that you need to know. And so I'm asking you, open up your mind and give God a chance. Just open up your mind. And you make the judgment of where you fit into what God has to say. Now this Bible, God did not consult me when it was written. I'm a newsboy, a deliverer of his word and what he says, and you'll find yourself fitting in the category in the scripture. Matthew, the seventh chapter, 21st verse, not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, 
But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now Jesus starts out in the seventh chapter, and the first thing that he says is about judging. Judge. If there's anything that we need to judge is ourselves, And that means we need to look into our lives and see if there's anything missing and that we need. And Jesus said it like this. He says, judge not that you be not judged. For whatever judgment you use to judge somebody else, then that same judgment is going to be turned and you're going to be judged the same way. So how do we judge people? Well, first of all, we judge Christ by the people that profess to be Christians. And I'm telling you, you've got the biggest disappointment coming in your life. Because I promise you, and this is one thing I've said. I'm not going to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Amen. We got them here. If you're one of them, I'm talking to you. And a hypocrite is somebody that pretends to be. Pretends to be. That's not. But this is the thing I want you to see. If you're going to judge yourself, don't judge yourself by me but you judge yourself by Christ. Now, how do you match up? You're awful short, aren't you? Because that's the real judgment that counts. And then Jesus went on to say, after judging, he says, pray. And so what are we to pray for? He talks about your heavenly Father knows what you need. And he said, if you ask as a physical son of your father, give me a loaf of bread, will your father give you a stone? If you ask meat, will he give you a snake to eat? Certainly not. If my children came to me and said, Daddy, I'm hungry, I'd give them something to eat, not a stone. So Jesus said, if you know as fleshly human beings how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more do I know how to give gifts unto my children that ask him? Then from there he goes on and he's explaining something. He says there are two paths in this world. There are two roads. One is a narrow road and one is a wide road. And the narrow road is Jesus Christ. And if you want to be saved, you come to Christ and ask Him to come into your lives and forgive you of your sins. But He said there's another road that is a broad road. Now, I've had people say this to me. Now, Glenn, I understand this. There's a Baptist road, a Methodist road, a Catholic road, a Presbyterian <coughs> road, a Episcopal road. All these are roads that's leading to God. Baloney. Amen. All denominations, including Baptists, are stickers that man has placed on them because of their particular belief. Baptists, for instance, we believe that you must be born again. We believe after you're saved, after you're born again, you follow the Lord in baptism, like what we did this morning. We believe that when you get saved, you can only be saved one time, and God gives you the gift of eternal life. You've got heaven promised to you. Now, all these other things, they are secular. They're not important. The most important thing is that you ask Christ to come into your life and give your life totally and wholly and freely over to Him. Now, that's the mainest thing. Now, you can live any way you want to, and God's not, He's not going to make you live one particular way. Right. It's like as a child. Your parent can tell you what you ought to do, but I promise you, when you get away from home, you're going to do what you want to do. <laughs> right? right? But the consequences is when you get back home. 
We raised two girls. And I was so cunning. Our girls would do something wrong. They would come home. I didn't know what they'd done, but I'd do this every weekend. And I'd say to them, what did you do last night? Oh, nothing. <laughs> and I'd say, you might as well have to come clean because I already know what you did. I had a phone call last night. And they told me where you were and what you did. I know. Now come clean, tell it like it is, and if you do, the consequences is not going to be very bad. And they they spill their goods. <laughs> Our girls were grown in their 20s, and one day they asked, Daddy, who told you all those things that we did? I said, nobody. <laughs> nobody. Well, how did you know? I knew because that's what I used to do. And I knew if I used to do it, you were going to do it too. But I wanted you to know there is a price to be paid for disobedience. Now you that are parents, you're raising kids. You've got a responsibility. It's a tough road. I know when we brought Tracy and Sam home from the hospital, they gave us a bill, but they didn't give us an instruction catalog. <laughs> They didn't tell us what to do when they cried. All you do is walk the floor and rock. You don't know anything about colic. So all through life, every day is a brand new day and a brand new situation and a brand new set of problems. And here you set out in your own power and ability to, to change their lives and mold and shape their lives. So the, he tells us there are two roads. Now it's up to you as a parent to put your children on the right path. Because, trust me, if they get started down the wrong road, it's going to be hard to get them off that road. Right. That's when rebellion comes in. That's when lying comes in. That's when they begin to go their own way. You say, I don't lie, you just did. Everybody lies. <laughs> you like that? Oh, I've never told a lie in my life. <laughs> so, parents, try to shape them and keep them down that road. You won't raise a perfect child. Trust me, it will not be perfect. Then he goes on to say, there will be false prophets. Now, when he's talking about prophets here, there are going to be false preachers. Now, we've arrived in this situation. You say, are you the only one who preaches truth? No. But I'm going to tell you this. If anybody, and we're here now, if anybody tells you that you can go to heaven without accepting Christ, they're lying to you. I've noticed in Hollywood, every star that dies and in baseball, football, basketball, and in every sport, when somebody dies, they always say this, I know they're up there looking down on us. So I've reached the conclusion, nobody's going to hell. <laughs> what do you think? That's the world. Nobody's going to hell. We want that soft, feely good security of saying I'm as good as they are. I preached a lot of funerals. Everyone without exception, especially the women, they'll come by and they'll look at their mother or their grandmother or their sister and this is what they say. If there's anybody that's going to heaven, they are. <laughs> if there's anybody going to heaven, they did. That makes you feel good, don't it? And I wondered, why are they going to heaven? They were the best person that I ever knew. Does that qualify? No. Does that put you in the position? No. Think about those things for just a minute. Now Jesus had started here in the seventh chapter, and now he comes to our text. And in the text he says, not every one 
that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father. So that tells me that everybody that says that God, or I believe in God, does that make you a Christian? No. The Bible says that the devil believes in God, and he trembles. So what makes us a Christian? The will of the Father. The will of the Father. What's the will of the Father? He said his will that none should perish, but all to come unto repentance. So that tells me that God does not want a person of flesh and blood that lives on this earth to die and go to hell. That tells me that. His will, his desire, his want to. But what makes the difference? Our choice. I chose this morning to get up. You did too. I chose this morning to not eat breakfast, just drink coffee. My choice. I thought I always eat me one of those little oatmeal cookies. Oh, I love those oatmeal <laughs> And I like it how that when you can drink coffee with the oatmeal cookie in your mouth, how it dissolves. <laughs> and oh, it's so sweet and it's so good. That's my choice. Some of you had biscuit, gravy, and eggs. Did your wife cook them this morning? Did you want them to be good? And they didn't get good. That's your desire. That's your choice. And I chose to come to church today. You made that decision to come to the house of God. Now, why'd you come? Maybe you came because your wife wanted you to. Or your husband wanted you to. And so you're trying to appease them. Because you don't want to hear it after they get home. And you don't want to see the expressions on their face when you get home. So this makes the relationship better. But let me tell you, the reason you're here today, whether you know it or not, that you might hear the Word of God. That you might be able to rightly make a decision in your life, whether or not you want to die and go to hell, or you want to accept Christ and go to heaven. Now, this is not a popular message. Uh, this message, I'm telling you, it's out of style like I am. You know what a fossil is, don't you? <laughs> Me. I'm an old fossil. But what I'm telling you is the only, it's not my way, not the Baptist way, it is the only way for you to get forgiven of your sins and have eternal life the only way. So he said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall inherit the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father. So he says, His will, none should perish, but all come unto repentance. That's God's will for your life. Right. Now, how's your life working out? <laughs> are you happy? Now, there are a lot of preachers today that will tell you, if you give your life to Christ, it's going to be the most wonderful life that you'll ever have. He'll put two, three cars in your garage. He'll give you a great home to live in. He'll put money in the bank and you can flourish and flourish and have a wonderful time. That's the biggest lie that's ever been puked out of the pits of hell. I hadn't seen that. God has always provided transportation God's always given me a place that I can lay my head out of the cold. God has always provided something for me to eat. I just thought of this, Miss Barbara. We hadn't been married too long, and we moved from Carolina to Jackson, Michigan. Well, when we got there, we got us an apartment. Now, this, I'm they called it an apartment. Man, it was a rat hole. I'm talking about a rat hole. And I got a job, or when I got there, I had a job. And all we had, we went to go two weeks before I could draw a paycheck. Well, something had happened, and we had had a 
overdraw at the bank. So we were in the red and the rears before we started. Then the first night I went to work, the police stopped me because I didn't have Michigan plates or Michigan driver license, and I got a ticket. Now here we are in a foreign land. Here we are broke with a cold check and two tickets arrested. Now how in the world I'm going to make it? Well, we had enough money to buy bread, bologna, and eggs. So we took and we bought bologna, bread, and eggs enough for two weeks. Two weeks was over with. We were going to make a paycheck. We could eat. Well, I came home, or the third shift came home. Barbara had fixed eggs, and she had a piece of bread there, and she had fried a piece of bologna. Or two pieces of bologna. <laughs> and two eggs. I thought, how wonderful that she is. And so I ate the two eggs, I ate the bread, and I ate the two pieces of bologna, and Barbara started crying. I said, what's wrong with you? She said, you ate my breakfast. <laughs> uh, why? Man, it's just two pieces of bologna. That's all we had. <laughs> I didn't think about her. <clears throat> so we went to bed. My wife fixes uh, the, the bed. She makes it up funny. She takes, tucks in the bottom, pulls them tight, and when you go to bed, each side's pulled tight so you get up at the top, put your feet in, and sliver down in the bed. <laughs> Here I had two eggs bread and two pieces of bologna. Now I'm in the bed. You can't turn over. You're just that. <laughs> and all at once I felt something on the back of my leg. I thought it was Barbara's toe. I said, quit. And it moved again. I said, quit. I said, I'm tired. Get over on your side of the bed. It moved again. Well, she said, I'm not touching you. About that time, whatever it was, ran up my back. And here you are, tucked in, laying on the cheek, can't get out, fighting in a rabbit as a little mouse. <laughs> now, we lived in a place that wasn't very good. And we had no money. Now, where are you? God had not always given me everything that I thought that I wanted in, in life, but he always supplied the need that I had in mind. He supplied that particular need. Uh, so he always meets the needs in your life. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of he that doeth the will of my Father. Now notice the next word. He says, many, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? The word prophesy means to preach, teach. Have we not taught others? Have we not preached the gospel and told others about you? Many will say unto me, I say, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And thy name casteth out demons or devils. And thy name done many wonderful works. Now this is where we are. The church is full of works today. I'm telling you, it's full of works. We want to feed the hungry. That's a good thing. We want to clothe the naked. That's a good thing. We want to give money to those that don't have money. That's a good thing. But what does God say about it? Those types of things does not get your name written in heaven, does not get you in the presence of God, does not give you eternal life, does not forgive you of your sin. I know it's getting hot in here, but it's going to be hot in hell. <laughs> right. If you've got a fan, fan yourself. I'm almost done. But Jesus said to them, You've done all these things. 23rd verse. And then I will profess. This is what he's going to tell everybody that does not know Christ as their Savior. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Boy, those are four words that are a terrible thing.
thing to your eye, never you, do you. In other words, you never knew me. Now, if we take a poll in here this morning and ask, how many believe in God? I promise you, without doubt, I think that every hand would go up. That's something as a little kid all the way up I never questioned. I believed in God. But that didn't save me. I believe in God. Does that save you? I believe in God. That doesn't mean you're forgiven. If that forgives you, if that gets your sins forgiven, if that places you in heaven, then Jesus got on the cross, suffered, bled, and died to no avail. It meant nothing. So that tells us that there is a necessity in our lives to invite Christ into our lives. Not by going to church, not by belonging to a denomination, but by receiving Christ into our life. We'll use two quick examples. It said that there was a man that was a young, young, rich ruler. Young, rich ruler. And it said he came running to Jesus. He knelt down and he said to him, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' response was this. He started to name the commandments. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Uh, he began to name them. The young man said, I've kept all these from the time I was a little boy. Now that sounds good. Are you a good person? I don't cheat anybody. I try to do everything I can to help people. I'm a, I'm a good person. That's what he's telling Christ. I'm a good person. But Jesus said, you're a good person, but there's one thing that's lacking in your life. Now, what was this one thing? He said, go and sell what you've got. Give it to the poor. Go and sell what you've got. Now, was his thing that he was lacking in his life that he was young? No. That he had too much money? No. That he wasn't a giver? No. The one thing in his life that, was, that he needed, his God was his wealth. Nothing wrong with being wealthy. Nothing wrong with being a millionaire or a trillionaire. Nothing wrong with it. But it's what your God is. So he's saying to that young man, you think you're good because you have morality. But I'm going to be first in your life. If I'm not first in your life, these other things don't mean anything. It said that the young man went away sorrowfully because he had great wealth. I promise you, if he had done that, that God would have made a way in his life, he'd been, he would have been restored everything that he had given right. because God would be number one. Mm -hmm. Second thing is in John the third chapter. It talks about a man named Nicodemus that he came to Jesus by night and he said this, we know, we know that thou art a man sent from God for no man can do the things that you do except he be sent from God. We know. Jesus said unto him, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Were you there when you were born from your mother? Yeah. <laughs> Rest of you next on a rock. <laughs> Nobody said they were born. I was, they told me that I was, but I'm so young at that time, I don't have any remembrance of it. My mother, I used to tell her, are you sure you picked up the right baby at the hospital? <laughs> because when you look at my mother, I don't look anything like her. My sister don't look anything like her. So I wondered if she got us mixed up and brought the wrong kid home. She said, I suffered. I suffered and brought you into this world. That's her remembrance. I don't have a remembrance. But my remembrance is of being born again 
is when I asked Christ to come into my life. I didn't have a choice in my first birth. But bless God, I had a choice in my second birth. Now, this comes to the question. Is church just for old folks? No. It's for folks that need to go to heaven. And it's, it's for folks that need to have their sins forgiven. That's what Christ is all about. Are you criticizing me, Glenn, because I'm not a Christian? No, I'm loving you. I'm trying to help you to go to heaven. Don't you want to go with me? Man, I want to go. And I'm going to go because I had a choice of that. That was my particular choice. So Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot enter or see the kingdom of God. And this is what he told him. You've got to have a spiritual birth just as you had a physical birth, a fleshly birth. I don't know why I'm preaching this this morning. This is an evangelist's sermon. <laughs> this is for people that are lost. I hardly ever preach evangelistic sermons. I always teach, preach to the church. Now, you know why? Because I believe with all my heart there's somebody that has a need to be saved today. Amen. Well, I'm not going to get saved today. Well, that's your choice. If I could choose for you, I'd get saved for you. But it's not by proxy. This is not an absentee vote. This is your desire. What you really want in your life. So, it says, What shall a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? What profit is it in being saved? Escaping hell. Escaping damnation escaping an eternal separation from God. Mm -hmm. Having your sins forgiven. What shall it profit me? I have a friend in Decatur, Alabama. He is the second wealthiest man in Decatur. 1995, his worth was over $50 million. Over $50 million. That is in 95. <laughs> It is no telling what the man is worth today. This is a statement. He and I were talking one day. And he said, Glenn, I wake up at night in a cold sweat and afraid. I said, Ray, what are you afraid of? He said, I keep having this same dream that somebody has stolen all the money that I have. And that I'm broke. I said, that must be a terrible dream. I don't have that problem. <laughs> Listen, if they stole what I got, bless God, they'd have to steal again. <laughs> promise you that. Because they wouldn't get much. In fact, baloney nicks. <laughs> that's about all they'd get. But that's sufficient for me. And I said, great. Why do you want to live that way? He said, it's a horrible experience. A horrible. Now, if there's not a change in that man's life, and he's 10 years older than me, he's 81. If, there, if there's not a change in his life, all this that he's accumulated in his life, he's going to give it. He has two daughters and one son. He's going to give it to them. And I know what they're going to do with it. Buddy, they're going to spend it like there's no tomorrow. Why? Because he's always been chintzy. He's always held on to the dollar. He's never given his kids a dime or anything of it. And they're just sitting back licking their lips. No. <laughs> <laughs> they say, Posse, thank you for taking care of our money. Now we're going to blow it and have a big time. Now you think about that. That's what I'd do if I was them. And lost it up done without God. I'd make him pay every time I dropped a hundred. 
I'd make him roll over in his grave every time I whipped out a thousand. And I'd think, old oh, Popsy, you're not here now. Thank you for working hard and saving and waking up in them cold sweats. Thank you, Popsy. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. But he that doeth the will of my Father. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, have I not prophesied thy name, and thy name cast out the devil, thy name done many wonderful work? Then I will profess unto them, <laughs> I never knew you. I never knew you. This is it. Going to hush. I watched Alabama play you last night. I'm basketball, I'm contemporary. Football, I'm Alabama. Man, Alabama shut LSU down. Number one running back in the nation, averaging 193 yards per game. I think he rushed for 37 yards. Had his head down, embarrassed. Nick Saban, he's the coach. Who's the coach of Kentucky? You know him, don't you? Mm -hmm. Who is he? Calipari. Ah, Red Sue. <laughs> Calipari. You know who I'm talking about? Do you know him? Yeah, everybody does. No Nick Saban? No, I wasn't. Well, you'll come around. <laughs> Let me tell you, you don't know Calipari. You know of him. He is not your friend. He is not your neighbor. He is nothing to you except a name. And I promise you, he don't know who you are. Think on that. That hurt your feelings? No. <laughs> My son-in-law. Look. They gave a supper, a fun for Nick Satan back in Alabama. So his brother got tickets. Now before the supper, they played golf. There were about 2,500 people that came and ate. Hope my son-in-law don't see this on the computer. My son-in-law said, I know Nick Saban, I played golf with him and I ate supper with him. But the thing he don't tell you, it cost a thousand dollars for him to play golf at each supper. And Nick Saban still don't know who he is. That's what Jesus is saying. I will profess unto my father, I never knew you. I know about Calipari, but Calipari doesn't know about me. That's your position as far as going to heaven. Let's stand together and bow.